This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 14th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the question legislators don't want constituents to ask. Is the legislator willing to put their money where their mouth is? Second, we explain why, to quote the late Yogi Berra, we feel like it's deja vu all over again on the K-12 through debate. And third, Michael and I have an extended discussion on the issue of federal tax cuts, which is coming back around again for discussion with the coming expiration of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, some interesting stuff today. Um, you've got some. Um, you, you've got some commentary, uh, and uh, and I'm ready to I'm ready to talk about it. Um, let's start off with number one. It, you said you have a question. It's the one question that Alaska legislative candidates just don't want you to ask them. So let's get started with that one, Brad. Yeah, I think the sneezing fit may have dislodged my ear your plugs also. So um, okay, yes. So it was it, it, following some people on Twitter, and I saw one comment that just really gelled for me. Uh, a a an issue that that I talk about a lot, but has been bugging me again recently. It was a comment by Janice Park, who is running for state senate against James Kaufman. Um, and the comment is, my opponent keeps saying we need better results before we fund essential, we fund essential services like public education. Funny how results don't show up without funding. Turns out you do, you do need to invest in the things that matter. And we can, you know, do a long discussion about K through 12 and funding K through 12 and, 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 and all that. But that's not, that's not the, that's not what came to mind as I saw that. It was the. We need better results before we fund, this is Janice, we fund essential services like public education. Turns out you do need to invest in things that matter. Well, Janice Park isn't going to be part of the funding of anything. She's not gonna be using her money. She's in the top 20%. She'll be in the top 20% if she's elected to the legislature. She's not gonna be using her money to fund anything. What she's doing, what she's talking about and what she, admits to in the Alaska Beacon uh, questions, is she wants to use your money, middle and lower income Alaska families, use your money to fund her priorities. There's nothing about, there's nothing we about this. The only we is she gets to decide if she's elected to the Senate, she gets to decide how she's gonna spend your, your money. She's gonna be insulated from that, paying a trivial share of her uh, income through PFD cuts, through her share of PFD cuts to, to fund it. And and as I thought about it, it's it's the one question that candidates don't want you to ask. Do you, are you willing, you, candidate X, are you willing to pay a share of the costs of what you're, of what you're suggesting uh, the legislature, the state should spend money on? And the answer, <laughs> When, when I asked that, when I, the few times I've asked that question, the candidate sort of goes, well, I am paying through PFD cuts. 
you're paying like 0.02% of your income through PFD cuts. But what you're asking middle Alaska, middle income Alaska families to do is to pay more than 5% toward the lower end, more than 8%. And you're asking the low 20% to pay more than 15% of their income. There's no we about this. It is, it is you shoving the burden off on, on everybody else. And, and candidates, when the few candidates I've asked this of, candidates go, well, 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 you know, I, I'd be willing to, to do something about it. Janice, Janice Park, in her, in her Beacon uh, comments, said she'd be willing to, to adopt Elise Galvin's um, uh, income tax as, as an approach to revenue. Well, we've analyzed that. We've, t we've talked about it on the show. We've talked about it in the, uh, in the landmine columns. And that's a very, very thin veneer of, in, of, of revenue that would be raised through Elise Galvin's income tax. The bulk of it would still come from, from PFD cuts. And they like to say, oh, well, but we'd be contributing more. They'd be contributing a little bit more. They might go from 0 0.2 or 0.02% all the way up to 0.2% uh, of their income with that tax. But it wouldn't, it would raise, I think, uh, I think the fiscal note accompanying Galvin's uh, bill is like more a uh, hundred million dollars out of a out of a one point five billion dollar deficit, it would raise a hundred million dollars, uh, a little over a hundred million dollars. And so you're not that's that what that is 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 you know this thin veneer that they're going to use to try to protect themselves about yeah I'd be willing to pay more I'd be willing to pay well it's not it's not more when you look when you even if you add that on we did a we did an analysis once of all the legis of all of the uh, House Finance Committee members, and what they would pay. They would pay personally, looking at their APOC reports and what their income is. What they would pay personally uh, as a result of the various bills, and all of the bills that involved some sort of broader base had them paying a little bit more, but still pushed the bulk of the burden because they because they didn't generate much revenue still push the bulk of the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts because you had to use PFD cuts to fill in behind the little bit of revenue that their that their bills raise. Right. So when she talk when she talks about we need better results before we fund essential services. I don't, she ain't talking about her. She's not talking she's not talking about her contributing more to to pay for this stuff. Yeah. She's talking about everybody else. So let me let me rephrase that. We need better results before we can take more of your dividend to pay for those results. Right? I mean, that's that's kind of the I mean, she's standing there stamping her foot. We need better results before we can take more of your PFD. Well, no, that's what she, that's what she's saying to Kaufman. What she's right, saying right. is we don't it, it, what she's saying, what she's saying, her results is funny how results don't show up without funding. She's saying we need to take your money. Sort of right before we see we, before we see better results, we got to build it to make sure that they'll come there. Is what you're saying? Yep. And it's just and Michael, it, the hypocrisy of it is just overwhelming. I mean, all these candidates, uh, uh, Jesse Bjorkman's another one down in the Kenai. We need more education funding. Well, Jesse, you're going to help pay for it? No, no, no. PFD cuts are a good thing to, to use. I, I mean, I I oppose says Jesse. I oppose Ben. Ben uh, 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 Ben Carpenter's sales tax because you know I'd have to pay for some of it. <laughs> it's it's I my donors would have to pay for some of it. It's it's the the hypocrisy of these candidates is just is just overwhelming when they start talking about we need to help you know we need to pay for it. It's not we, right, Charlie? It's what? it's 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 everybody. It's the eighty percent of the family, eighty uh, percent of Alaska families that aren't you. You know, it still hits me all the time, Brad, is the fact that all these people just seem immune. We were talking about this with Nick Begich yesterday. It's just they just seem immune to arithmetic, right? There's money in and there's money out. You can't just keep taking money out and expect it's all going to work out. You've got everybody's got to put a little skin in the game and nobody seems as long as they can take the PFD, it'll be fine up until the PFD has gone. And then it'll be, well, we now we need more money. I mean, it's just there is never. There is never enough. It's there's just never enough on the other end. Michael, I, I, I mean, we have this debate between the two of us uh, often. Um, if they had to pay, if candidates had to pay, if Natasha had to pay the same percent of her income 
that she proposes to take out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families uh, through PFD cuts. If she had to contribute the same percent of her income, I think I think the results of what we're seeing at the legislature would be far different. I think they'd go, whoa, you know, you're, you're proposing to take my money now for government before. Hey, it, it was good before we could just take middle and lower income Alaska families money. That was that was fine. But you're proposing to take my money now. Wait, 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 wait. We need to look at the spending. Uh, but before we before we go off and do that. And I think if candidates had to confront, I mean, Alaska is unique in that we've got the PFD and they can cut the PFD and they can look like legislators can look like heroes because they funded things, but they haven't had to pay for it themselves. They and their donors haven't had to pay for it, pay for it themselves. If they if we existed in a, in a, in a normal state, in a state where legislators also had to contribute to the costs of to the costs of the spending programs they were they were voting on, I think the results would be different. I think people would I think people would push back. Their donors would push back on them. They would push back on the on the legislation, and I think we'd have an entirely different thing. But we've got a system now where they get to say, like Janice Park does, you know, we we need to see better results before we fund essential services. Well, there's just no we to it. I mean, they get to they say that. But but that's not what's going on. What's yeah, going what, on is is her is her pushing it down the down the down the hill. What she meant was the royal we. The we is in the nouveau riche nobility of the legislature. The royal we uh, is what it means. And you're right. I mean, what what's the low income uh, impact again, Brad? Twenty four percent or something of a PFD it, it, on, the, on the lowest it, twenty percent. Yeah, it depends on what the it depends on what the deficit is, but it's fifteen to twenty percent uh, based on current yeah. deficit. So, sure. could you imagine somebody like uh, Natasha von Imham having to fork over fifteen to twenty percent of her income every year towards the state government? Um, you know, you make a million bucks a year, you got to pay one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars to the state government to pay for all those services. Yeah, there'd be a bit of a revolt. I mean, if I had to pay another fifteen to twenty percent on what I'm already paying, I mean, I, I you know. Yeah, there would be a revolt. Not that it would take that much. You and I have talked about that. It takes but a fraction of that if it's spread equally to uh, to to make up for that. But yeah, everybody would have skin in the game. I mean, I'm just I'll be honest. I'm just sick of the whole thing of they just, again, spending in ad finitum. It's never enough. Whatever it is, it's never enough. Welcome to the octagon, says Brian. Yeah, no, that's exactly. I feel like I'm in the, I feel like I'm just like one too many hits with a snake. We're on, it's, we're on Groundhog Day. This is going to be a repeat here as we go, uh, as we go forward here, Brad. I'm not trying to argue with you, Brad. I just, I just think it's hysterical that you're right, that this whole point of it really is the royal we, right? We know better than you, oh, you poor peasants. We'll, we'll give you what you need and deserve when we decide to do it, even though it's your money that we're taking from mostly the poor peasants out there. We'll do it, and we will not part with a single farthing of our money. I just, I, I just feel like that's the voice I hear in my head every time we start talking about this. It is. It is. And Janice Park is, is right up there, is ranking right up there, uh, in 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 her use, I mean, she's 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 trying to. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of Kaufman. He's also voted for PFD cuts to fund this stuff, but but Park is just out there saying we need this, we need that, we need to we need to build this, we need to you know spend on this, we need to find benefits, we need, and it's all this we stuff when she isn't going to pay, a, maybe a dime, but she's not. She's not paying anywhere near the burden that she's going to shift to middle and lower income Alaska families with all this, with all this we stuff. And you just you, you keep hearing this, and it just sort of piles on me, and finally finally gets to me. It's the hypocrisy of all this. You know, I know I I know what we need what we need. I know how we need to invest, and so I'm 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 the voice of the people on on how to how to invest. No, you're not. You're not you're not putting a dime into this. It's everybody else you want. You want you want to pay for it, and 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 you want to cover yourself with this thin veneer of oh, I support I support an income tax. I support Elise Galvin's income tax. Oh, goody goody, you raise one fifteenth of the amount of revenue we need. The other fourteenth fourteen fifteenths are going to have to come from PFD cuts. But you feel all good about yourself because you say that oh, I'm willing to pay an income tax. Well, you know it's it, it when you look into the numbers, the hypocrisy 
of this group that's going around talking about we need to invest, we need to spend, we need to grow, we need to, it, it, it the hypocrisy of that is just is just overwhelming. Well, they have all these grandiose ideas. They have all these ideas. I mean, this is part of the problem. Uh, it, and it's always, of course, as we've talked about in the past, it's always about opium, right? OPM, other people's money. I have all these grandiose ideas of what we should do and how we should do it. As long as we have other people's money to spend, it's all good. Um, but we don't have a proportionate amount of skin in the game. And uh, don't you dare ask us to put more skin in the game. In fact, everything you're talking about, putting having us put more skin in the game is anathema to us. We don't believe in new taxes, but we'll just take the PFD. Yeah, I, the reaction, I mean, the reaction of some to Ben's sales tax when he proposed it. Oh, sales tax, that's horrible. Turns out it's better than PFD cuts. <laughs> I mean, it's they, anything anything that, that doesn't fit their preconceived notion. They don't do analysis. They don't do numbers. They don't look at charts. They don't do calculations. Anything that doesn't fit their preconceived analysis of what it is, of what it is they think they need to be doing, uh, it's just you know immediately uh, disparaged, and and then you know when they're finally called on it, like Janice Park, when they're finally called on it, and said, okay, what are you going to do about this? Oh, I'll agree to a, a an income tax that raises a hundred billion dollars out of a one point five billion dollar deficit. Well, that's just a joke. I mean, you, you right. look at the calculations right. of of what that does to legislators, and it's like you know adds a little bit this much to their to their burden and continues to shift the burden to middle and lower right. Alaska it's like the difference between buying a burger and buying a brand new car right oh i can buy another burger uh versus the impact of somebody else is trying to buy a new car i mean that's just yep. that's that's the whole uh when you look at it that's the that's the whole movement and, and again the 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 bottom line of this whole thing is just this unquenchable thirst for more 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 money more programs more things we need to do. As long as it's somebody else's money, exactly. it's always more. M O A R more. That's so. that's the key part. As long as it's somebody else's money. Yep, exactly. Just like that. All right, Brad Keith, Lee Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets joins us this morning as we continue on with the weekly top three. We're on to number two. Oh, Brad, 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 Bradley, Brad, Bradley. Here we go again. I just, I don't even know what to say, but here we go again. You sent me this article and I immediately threw something across the room because what does it say? What does it say, Brad? I'll just leave it to you. I can't even, I can't even face it at this point. So the headline, this is in the uh, Alaska Public Media uh, this week. The headline is Anchorage School District braces for another significant budget deficit. Uh, and it's talking about a, a presentation by uh, the chief financial officer of the ASD uh, to a late September meeting of the joint meeting of the Anchorage School Board and Anchorage Assembly, outlining um, a ASD chief financial officer Andy Ratliff said the deficit would likely be between, here we go, 64 and $84 million. 64, another deficit of 64 to eighty. Four million dollars. Not a very uplifting picture at this point, said Ratliff. And then here's here's the thing that really that really got me. Here's the paragraph. Ratliff said enrollment decline of about five thousand students in Anchorage and unstable state funding have contributed to the deficit. The school board could vote to spend down available savings, shrinking the budget deficit by twenty million dollars. If the district Quote, if the district had to rely on staff reductions alone to make up the shortfall, Ratliff said that a quarter of the district's workforce would be cut. That's the that's the sentence that that people are now going to go out and use to try to justify the 64 to 84 million. The state helping close the 64 to 84 uh, million dollar deficit. If we had to if we had to rely on staff reductions. That would be a quarter of the district's workforce would have to be would have to be cut. You remember in 2016 when Walker started to try to justify the uh, PFD cuts or start, started to justify the need for additional revenues. And what he what his what his talking points synthesized down to was how much of state government would have to be closed, how many people would have to be laid off, 
how much of a disruption uh, that would occur if they tried to do it through staff cuts as opposed to reductions in spending in other other areas or through more through, through more equitable revenues talked about how much how much reduction in workforce that have to be and that was the the sentence the the phrase the comment that i heard over and over and over during that period oh we'd have to close down i don't know what it was 50% 75% of government we'd have to lay off 75% of the employees if we if we tried to close it uh, through spending cuts and that's the one that's the that's the the, the analogy or that was the that was the principle that they just went back to over and over and over now we've got the asd coming back to the same thing the same walker approach if the district had to rely on staff reductions alone to make up the shortfall ratliff said a quarter of the district's workforce would be would be cut so we're going to go through this again uh about you know anchorage and, and by extension you know you sort of use anchorage as the gateway into the rest of the state by extension it must be the rest of the state is uh is in dire fiscal need and we have to we have to increase state funding uh for these schools in order to in order to make up for it so the figure that i found really interesting in that same paragraph that will get glossed over uh and in, in, in the arguments by those who want to increase spending ratliff said enrollment decline of about five thousand students in anchorage and unstable funding have contributed to the deficit. They've lost 5,000 students. They're losing 5,000 students. Um, uh, that's, a, between... I mean, that's, a ch that's a chunk when you look at it. I mean, and, and is that in a single year? Because if so, that is huge. Uh, when you look at the number of students who are in the Anchorage School District, that's almost 10% of their overall student base in a single year, if that's the case. Yeah, I didn't go back to uh, I didn't go back to check it. The article is written as if that is a single year number, uh, and maybe it maybe it's over a period of time. But five thousand students, I'm, you know, people, you could say people are voting with their feet, and 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 voting with their with their, you know, pencils and things by and taking them home or taking them to charter schools or taking them to the other locations. I guess charter schools would still count in that five thousand. Taking them in in other places where people are leaving. Or kids, or you know, parents aren't putting their kids into the school district. You could say that you know that people are voting with their feet. And why do you fun keep funding something? Why do you keep throwing more funds at it when when they're losing when they're losing students? Um, that's that's a, a a figure that I thought was 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 really significant and one that that we ought to spend a whole lot more time looking to looking into. But instead, what people will be will be talking about is the last figure in the paragraph, if the district had to rely on staff reductions alone to make up the shortfall, Ratliff said that a quarter of the district's workforce could be cut. So that's, I mean, we're back at it. Uh, we're not even through this election cycle yet. We're not even through, you know, people generally talking about K through 12 and, and the need to increase funding K through 12. ASD sticks it right in there, sticks a, sticks a, a number right in there. Uh, uh, in the middle of the final weeks of the election, and said, "Oh, we're you know we're in dire straits. We're about to go down downhill uh, uh, if we don't uh, if we don't get additional funding." Right. So the budget's not even going to be set till February. Right. That's when the budget is set. So they're already sounding this bugle early on because, well, it's election season. We're three weeks from the election. Two and a half, three weeks from the election. Um, and so they're already sounding it now. Don't think that this timing is an accident. And I will point out how much words matter, Brad, because you've you've already said this sentence five or six times. But let me just point out that it said if the district had to rely on staff reductions alone to make up the shortfall, if they're playing out the worst case, if all we had to do was cut people, but they didn't talk about any of the other potential measures. They just said if we have to only face on now, if you did lose 5,000 students, which would be about with the $5,800 per about $29 million, right? Would be about 5,000 students. If you did lose the 5,000 students, to me, that would mean that you would be able to reduce your workforce to a commensurate amount because now you're serving less students. So, I mean, hey, things have got to shrink, right? That's That's what's going to happen. Um, but they still have the hold harmless. They still have some other things that are going on here. But it, remember, it's they can all come back and say later, well, I was truthful. 
I didn't say we were going to cut a quarter of the district's workforce. I just said if we were going to rely on that alone, that's what it would be. But, of course, the only thing people are going to remember is, oh, my God, they're going to cut 25 percent of the workforce. This is all theater. That's what it is. They're they're getting it out there to try and bolster the the school spending crowd and get them going. This is all this is all a hundred percent political. And if you're telling me that you are such a piss poor manager with money in the school district that you have a second year of another sixty million dollar deficit, somebody needs to be fired. <laughs> yeah, so well, I'm a little fired up about it. You're you're using up all of your after your your, your material for your after after segment. Oh no, there will uh, be plenty left. Trust me. But it's like Walker. I mean, you're right. It does say if. But it's like Walker. I mean, it, Walker said if I have to if I have to close this deficit by by cutting spending, I'll have to wipe out fifty percent or seventy five percent or whatever the number was of state government employees and state government and services and all that sort of all that sort of stuff. It is. It is picking the most damaging way of solving your issue and highlighting that as as the key potential um, uh, when you're when you're trying to get more funds. I mean, right behind that is going to come. Oh, we're going to have to close more schools. We're going to have to close more programs or we're going to have to close this. We're going to have to close that. Whatever their polling is telling them will trigger the the, the constituency most is what they'll be citing as as the thing they're going to have to do uh if uh if they don't get if they don't get additional funding so it's it we're, we're in for another round of this uh it will it will last through the election cycle certainly it'll last into the into the uh session and then it'll last through the session uh, with anchorage leading the way talking about you know how desperate how desperate its times are having lost five thousand students having people voting with their feet to leave the district or not come into the district, um, or families not moving here and not coming into the district, having having people voted with their feet saying, "Oh my, you know, we need more money to cover this deficit that's created by people leaving us." That's that's in the in the utility world, you call that a death cycle, uh, or a, a, a death ring. It is it is doom loop. More, the doom, doom loop. loop. <laughs> more funding, lose people. More fun, less fun lose people and you just keep going you keep going down down and down no that's exactly what it is it is a smaller you know the small the pie gets smaller and smaller and every time somebody leaves you have to spread it out amongst fewer people which again forces more people to leave which again yada 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 it just continues and that's where we're at right now i mean if it is five thousand in a single year which I mean, if if that that should have been if that was the case, that should have been the key focus of the whole story. Why are we losing five thousand students out of a district of, I think it's fifty five or fifty eight thousand students, sixty thousand students? Why are we losing that many students in a single year? If that's the case, but that didn't even become the question. The question becomes a sob story of we can't do it. And and he does mention early on. Ratcliffe's projections come early in the budgeting process. The school board won't vote to approve the district's budget till the end of February. They've got five months to figure something out. They had a hundred million dollar deficit last year. Now they still have a sixty-five million dollar deficit this year. Somebody is not doing their job if that's the case. Well, they have five months really to hone in on their message, Michael. It's not going to be five months. To figure it out, you're giving the school board too much credit. It's going to be five months to hone in on the message that hits legislators most. So people like Janice Tark, Park can talk about, we need to increase funding. No, we about it. It's all middle and lower income Alaska families. You're you're going to be exempt from it. But we need to increase funding in order to do this. That That's the five, the five months is going to be spent honing the message, honing the strategy for how they, you know, turn up the tears and how they turn up the emotions to the point where they where they where they get the funding. And that's that's how the five months will be spent. It's not going to be spent in in responsibly trying to manage like a business would, responsibly trying to manage the 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 loss of customers, the loss of clients, uh, and and responding to that with with budget reorientation. It's going to be five months of, yeah, well don't pay any attention to the five thousand. Pay attention to the fact we need more funds or we're going to have to cut, we're going to have to cut employees. That that's well, what the five months is going to be spent on. 
and how much of this again continues to be budgeting by crisis right so again last year it's reported in this article 100 million dollar deficit this year 65 to 85 million dollar deficit they continue to just bet on the if come. It's just like, we're going to build a whole budget based around, well, we don't know, but we'll make it large enough that the state has to continue to bail us out no matter what. We'll have no fiscal discipline. We're not going to consolidate. I mean, we're not going to pull down. They talked about closing a bunch of schools last year. They didn't close one. They, they took one and they converted it into something else which didn't even close the school, still costs them money. They're not closing any of the schools. It's like they're just resistant to this whole thing and say, it's like the child, again, stamping their feet saying, I want mine, I want it now. Give it to me. That's what they're yep. saying. Yep. And, and you know, 5, 000, it, it doesn't really matter to me if it's 5,000 in one year or 5,000 over two, th two years or 5,000 over five years, 1,000 a year. It doesn't really matter. You're losing customers. What business is going to sit there and go, oh, I'm losing customers. I need more money. They're going to go, I'm losing customers. I need to reorient things in order to keep my, in order to keep my customer base. I need to bring people back in, attract them back in from, from wherever they've gone. I need to attract them from, from, from outside. And, and I need to reorient, reorient my business to do that. And I need to reorient my business to account for the fact that I've lost 5,000 customers. And, but, but this, this business is saying I've lost five thousand customers. I need more money. <laughs> right, right. Somebody you need, you need to compensate me for having run off customers. That's right, that's right. Somebody needs to pay me. I don't care who it is, but somebody needs to pay me because we've got to be held whole while the rest of the world falls apart around us and our and our customer base goes down. We need to we need to be living the same lifestyle that we were living before. Doesn't matter if we've got a champagne taste and a beer budget. Doesn't matter anymore because we're we need that money. We still need to live the way that we were living. Nobody should get hurt. Everybody should be held harmless. Uh, it doesn't matter to us that the kids are gone. We still got people to pay. Um, and and it, it's a complete divorcing for, uh, from reality at that point. And, and it's we need more money, but we sure as hell don't want to pay for it. We want we yeah. want other people to pay yeah. for it by pushing it down through by pushing it down through PFD cuts. It's the worst. It's the it's the it's the worst possible combination. Increase spending for losing customers. We need more money because we're losing customers, but we don't want to pay for it. So we need to pull money from middle and lower income Alaska families in order to pay it for pay for us. So we get to continue to keep our salaries and continue to keep our raises. I'm just stuck on this 5,000 student number. I mean, if it did, and Donna clarified it for me because I was, I was, I always try and overestimate if I can't remember the exact number. She said the ASD is reporting that they had 43,000 students. So if it was a 5,000 student drop, that means they lost 12% of their student base. Like if it was in a year, that's huge because what it tells you is exactly what Brad said. People are voting with their feet. And it may not just be the school district. It may be the direction that the city, the assembly is going and that the, the direction that the city overall is going. It could be the increased crime and the more shootings and the things. And then, I mean, it could be a lot of combination of factors, but it shows that people are leaving uh, one way or the other. But 5,000 students out of a 40, you know, 43, 44,000, 45,000 uh, a student total is a huge number and they're not addressing that it all becomes about the funding and that 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 loss they're not talking about brad yeah well yeah and they i mean janice park does talk about it she says we need more money we need more programs we need more we need more spending we need more we need more of this and more of that in order to in order to you know compensate the teachers uh keep the programs going she doesn't talk about kids i mean janice park hasn't been talking about about the student loss and reattracting students, but let's let's say that's included. Uh, but you know the the hypocrisy of it is then she says, and that more needs to come from middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, by funding it through uh, PFD cuts, or maybe maybe I'll contribute a little bit through Elise Galvin's uh, uh, income tax and, and claim then that I'm contributing uh, to the to the problem when she's when she's not. But you can't. I mean, I, it doesn't really matter to me what. What the cause is let's say it's the city let's say it's the policies of the city assembly let's say it's the taxes let's say whatever it is you've lost five thousand students you've lost customers and when you lose customers you have to do things differently you don't you don't get to go out and say oh i lost customers i need to make up for it by you 
by you giving me more money. Um, you, you lost customers. You need to deal with the fact you lost customers and you need to do something to, to at least stop the, stop the bleeding. Uh, if not, if not rebuild, not rebuild that customer base. And, and I've never seen a business say I've, I've lost customers. You, well, I've seen utilities try it, right? Utilities push people, you know, ha have lost customers or lost, lost sales. They say, I need more money because I lost sales. Um, utility commissions tend not to react to that very well. Uh, and we That's as right. ci citizens should not react very well to, Anchorage saying, I've lost 5,000 students. You need to give me more money to make up for. This is part of the problem of, you know, that, that again, the government faces, Brad, is that they don't respond well to market forces, right? If there's a drop in revenue, if there's a drop in student base, if there's a drop in anything like that, they don't react the way a normal business would. A normal business would tighten the belt, lay off people consolidate facilities, shrink their real estate footprint. There'd be a variety of, of, of stri uh, strategies that they'd use to try and reduce their overall costs uh, to, to stay afloat and get things going on. But again, the government is so divorced from all of that, they immediately just say, well, we just need more. Um, and there is no connectivity in those things of cause and effect. And that is, again, part of this huge problem. Yeah. And they devise strategies, government devises strategies to say, I've lost, you know, to use the things that they should be doing to, to really argue for more money. Well, I guess I could close schools. I guess I could close buildings. And if you target target the right buildings to get the right parents, you know, the parents that are the donor class or the parents that are the loudest, if you target that right, you can turn up the knob on on people screaming for for more money. Or, you know, I guess I could cut salaries or I could cut staff or I could cut this or I could cut. And then people start talking about jobs and they start talking about the economic impact of losing those jobs. And, and, and it's, it's, a diver it's all a diversion, right? Away from the fact they lost 5,000 customers uh, over, over whatever period of time they lost them over. To divert away from the fact they lost 5,000 customers. Um, and, and government is uniquely, Alaska government is uniquely situated to deal with that. Uh, poorly, because they say, oh, we lost customers, we need more funding. And then legislators say, oh, I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to give them more funding and keep Johnny's school open, my donor's school open, or, you know, keep all those, keep all those people employed. Uh, I'm going to be a hero and do that. Guess what? I don't have to pay for it. Isn't that, isn't that the fun part? I can be a hero, Andy Josephson. I can be a hero by continuing government spending. I don't have to pay for it. Because I can push all the costs down to middle and lower income Alaska families who I claim I'm representing. It's it's Alaska. Alaska is just just perfectly set up for this sort of this sort of gamesmanship. We're back with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad's going to talk about number three, which has to do with tax cuts. And then I'm going to take a position that that probably it's not going to be antithetical to Brad, but it'll probably make him laugh. So, Brad, go ahead. Uh, let's talk about tax cuts and some of the mythos around tax cuts. Go ahead and give it to me. Mythos? What's mythos? My th the, myth, the myths. The, ah, the, okay. The lore. The, 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 yes, go ahead. All right, I got it. So in a Fairbanks News Miner article, the headline is Congressional Forum in Fairbanks Focuses on Economic Issues. And down at the bottom, it reports on, th this is a debate uh, between uh, uh, Mary Pel Peltola, Congressman Peltola, and uh, uh, Nick Begich uh, uh, about about the election, and it was hosted by Fairbanks, and so the Fairbanks News Miner is reporting on it. And one of the issues they dealt with was tax cuts. And down at the bottom uh, of the article, way at the bottom of the article, they've got the, the the positions of the parties on the tax cuts. And the and the question that they were asked about was what are the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that expires is set to expire in 2025. Next, next year, the beginning of the next congressional session, what steps they would take to make sure tax policies favor economic growth and business competitiveness. And, and the thing that really, that really interests me is that is the report is both candidates agreed that they would support the renewal of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, and, and support the continuation of the, of the lower uh, rates that resulted from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Most economists, 
I would, I would dare say almost all economists, because even Cato Institute agrees, uh, admits to it, that have agreed that uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act resulted in, has resulted in increasing the deficit, lowering revenues from where they otherwise would have been uh, under the, under the pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. There has been some revenue response. There was some increase from the lower level that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act could have, that some predicted the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act could have resulted in, that there was some additional investment, there was some additional revenue for the Treasury produced by it, but it's not enough to offset uh, the reduction that the Tax, tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, created. And so, and so the, the extension, most economists, Cato is an exception to this a little bit, but most economists agree the extension it will have the same effect. It will continue to widen the the, the deficit that is occurring in, uh, uh, in in federal spending. Now, if you ask Nick about the deficit, Nick says the deficit's wrong. We need to close the deficit, and you can reconcile these positions. But but it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I agree to continued tax cuts that are widening the deficit and at the same time argue that we've got to that we've got to close the deficit. Now Nick would say he's going to close it all through spending. Um, and and would reconcile it that way. It's better to have tax cuts and have the have some increased revenue, some increased investment, some increased revenue to the treasury that contributes in part to uh, to paying for itself and then and then spending cuts are going to do the rest and he would say that's how he's going to close the deficit. But it's funny that the that the that the spending cuts that the spending cuts never never happened. I'm I was reminded as I was reading of this of a, a Brookings Institute analysis of the Reagan tax cuts. The Reagan tax cuts when when President Reagan was first elected, and those were dramatic tax cuts. The as as summarized by Brookings, the top rate fell from seventy five percent to fifty percent. But even then, the tax cut didn't pay for itself. According to later Treasury estimates, it reduced federal revenues by about nine percent in the first couple of years. In fact, most of the top Reagan administration officials didn't think the tax cut would pay for itself. They were counting on spending cuts to avoid blowing up the deficit, but the spending cuts never materialized. So the, the, the lesson when you look back over this period from the Reagan tax cuts on through the Bush tax cuts and on through, on through other things, the, the, the record is, yes, people say that that we will close the deficit by increased economic economic activity resulting from these tax cuts. And there is some increased economic activity. There is some increased revenue from that increased economic activity. And there is some contribution toward closing the deficit, toward closing that gap from that. But the rest of it always has to come from spending cuts. And the spending cuts never happen. So, so the deficit continues to, the deficit continues to grow. It, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to 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 take, especially Peltola, who's been voting for increased spending. It's hard for me to take those statements. I'm concerned about the deficit, we need to close the def. We need to close the deficit. I I want to do tax cuts, and and we'll do that in part through through reducing spending. It's hard for me to to take all that, and sort of and sort of agree with it because. The history tells us that we just don't do the hard part. We don't do the spending cuts that uh, that are necessary to it. One one other thing that I think is useful, and this comes from Cato, the most pro growth tax cuts tend to be permanent changes that increase the after tax return to investment, such as business expensing, lowering business taxes, and cutting capital gains taxes. And and that was a lot of the 2016 Tax Cut uh, Act. These types of changes can at least be partly deficit finance without worsening the long run fiscal outlook and could improvement it could improve it if revenues uh, uh, the revenues generated over time but tax cuts for businesses are always are always combined with tax cuts for individuals because because you know the democrats argue with some with some justification the democrats argue look if you're going to cut taxes for business you need to cut taxes for individuals also you shouldn't you shouldn't give business all the benefit of the tax cuts uh, without giving individuals. And this is what Cato, Cato says about tax cuts for, for individuals. Tax cuts for workers and consumers also have some positive effects, such as encouraging additional work and entrepreneurship. 
but mostly, but most are not sufficiently pro-growth to expect a larger economy to make up most of the lower revenue. Individual tax cuts are still worthwhile, but they should be paired with spending cuts to ensure the reduced revenue um, is sustainable. That is, that it that it doesn't grow the deficit. So even if you say, look, we're gonna make, we're gonna, we're gonna make these tax cuts, they're pro-growth because we're gonna make these tax cuts entirely on the business side. That's not gonna happen because you're gonna to have to include individual tax cuts to, to get it through Congress. And when you include individual tax cuts, you end up severely dampening the pro-growth effect. The overall package severely dampens the pro-growth effect of the business tax cuts. And so, and so you end up with, with increased deficits, lower revenues and increased deficits. The key is, are you really willing to step up and make the spending cuts? And the history is from Reagan on that hasn't happened. And so what tax cuts have ended up doing is increasing deficits. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily arguing against the tax cuts. I'm not necessarily arguing against the extension, but you've got to, you've got to really hit hard on the need for spending cuts to go with it. And in, in fact, you need to start your statement with that. I'm for tax cuts if, and only if we started off with big spending cuts, then the tax cuts have the have the opportunity to be to be revenue neutral. If you don't start your statement that way, you're really you're mil really misleading people about what the effect of the tax cuts are going to be. Surprisingly, as a libertarian, uh, I'm in favor of the tax cuts because uh, I and I understand that they're kin that they don't pay for themselves in the short run. Over the longer term, and I think if you look at it over a, a larger window, it probably makes up some of it, but not all of it. I'm still for it because again. <clears throat> Taxes are theft, all right? And and if we don't figure out a way to starve the beast, and here's the thing, they can't print money forever, Brad. They, they, that is, it's eventually going to have diminishing returns. Now, it's going to do one or two things. Either they're going to learn their lesson and figure that out, or the markets will figure it out for them and the dollar will crash. One of the two. Now, I hope for the one rather than the other, but eventually... The wheels are going to come off this bus. They just can't keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. Well, Michael, it's been, it's been 45 years since the Reagan tax cuts. And, and this analysis done by Brookings was what, last year? Yeah, 2017. Um, so it was it was with uh, 40, 40 years, well, nearly 40 years yeah. perspective at that time and, and concluded that that even though the Reagan tax cuts were huge and should have generated a lot, a lot of activity, and they did generate a lot, a lot of activity, it wasn't enough to, to make up for the uh, for the deficits they created. Same analysis of the Bush tax cuts cuts in the early, in the early 2000s. And so, yeah, we can say, you know, they're ultimately going to get the message, and they're going to start they're start going to start offsetting these these revenue reductions with uh, with with spending cuts, but it just hasn't hasn't happened. And I don't I. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm cheering for the one for the alternative where, you know, everything crashes and burns and the and the dollar becomes worthless and all that sort of stuff. I, that's not that's not my idea of good policy or idea of a good of a good landing point. So, well, it's, yeah. I got so wrapped up in this, Brad, I ran over the end of the hour. So we're 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 in overtime already. I've just, you know, I mean, I, you know, I knew I know that that's not that that it doesn't feel my position doesn't feel like a responsible position because I'm just, I'm angry. And I think I'm matching the feeling of a lot of Americans who are basically saying the same thing, who are saying it's got to stop. And you're right. Do they have the fiscal will to do it? Do they have the political will to do the, the fiscally sound thing? Obviously not. Would I hope that Begich would get in there and be a lone voice? Maybe he and Mike Lee and five or six other guys out of 500 would say, we've got to do the right thing or that we're going to hit the wall. Um, maybe, maybe it'll make a difference. Maybe it won't. But in the meanwhile, I'd rather that citizens had more of their own money to do what they could do to prepare for the end, because that's kind <laughs> of, I mean, really, I mean, that's, am I wrong? I mean, that's kind of what's going to happen because as you said, they're not going to stop. The only thing that's going to stop them is the events themselves. That's that's what's going to stop them at this point. Am, am I wrong, or what? What do you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is the end coming because they simply can't control themselves, or well, will they will they pull back from the edge? 
Oh, I don't think they'll pull back from the edge. I think it's like Alaska. They'll just go plunging over the edge and just and just keep and just keep doing it. I mean, Alaska kept spending, even though we now we're now into you know PFD cuts, taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. They just they just they just keep spending, and and I don't have faith that that Congress is capable uh, of stopping itself. I mean, it, it, again, I, I'm a pay as you go guy. I mean, that's 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 my fundamental that's my fundamental starting point. You want to spend something? Fine, go ahead and spend it, but you, you and me have got to pay for it. We both got to pay a substantial amount uh, for it. We can't, we can't deficit spend. We can't, you know, rely on future generations as the federal government does by, by issuing bonds. And we can't rely on middle and low income Alaska families as, as Alaska does by pushing it down to PFD cuts. You and I, us, the ones that are voting for it, we've got to be responsible and we've, and we've got to pay for it. If we are not willing to pay for it, then it's something we ought not be doing. We, we ought not to be saying we need it, but we're going to make somebody else pay for it. We, we've got to we've got to have that responsibility. And to me, taxes are, I mean, as bad as they are, and I understand that they're theft, but as bad as they are, they're they're paying for it. They aren't paying all of it. I mean, I mean, if we're going to keep this spending up, we ought to be paying for all of it. And taxes, frankly, ought to be higher. That would help curb spending. Uh, but but I I I I don't get real excited about. Let's just go crash and burn. Let's just let's just keep cutting taxes. Oh, and keep not, increasing. Wait, and wait, keep I'm increasing not, spending. I'm not excited about uh, crash and burn. I'm saying at some it's inevitable at some point because they cannot control themselves. And I would rather the people who are there who are trying to live day to day and who are going to be paying the price. Because trust me, Brad, if the yogurt hits the oscillating rotor. Do you think the elites in Washington are really going to feel the pain? They're no. going to be isolated, right? They're the they're the nouveau riche nobility. I mean, they're the they're the lords of the land. They won't feel it. The whole the the economy could crash, the wheels could come off the bus and they'll just be sitting on their private islands or wherever in their bunkers or you know whatever picture you want to paint and they're not going to feel it. It'll be the mom and pops, the people who are trying to put their kids through school, the people trying to live on a different, uh, you know, on a set retirement. They're the ones that are going to feel it. I would rather they have the money in the short run, in the beginning, to be able to prepare and deal with something like that than give it to the politicians, even if it hastens the end at that point, because it can't continue. Well, yeah. Uh, but but we're we're hasten we are hastening the end. I mean, if if we continue to go down this road, it and and it's to some degree to some degree it's it's a chicken and egg situation, right? I mean, Nick Begich would say, "Oh, I'm going to cut spending so we can afford to do these tax cuts," and they're going to they're going to sort of be a little bit closer to revenue neutral than maybe not. But yeah, they're still going to create deficits. But we can still we can still do that because I'm going to cut spending. And and to me, a pay as you go guy. That is okay. Show me first because we got a 25% deficit in the federal budget. Show me first that you can cut spending, and then we can start talking about you know some proportionate response in terms of cutting revenues. But it's never that way. It is I'm going to cut re I'm going to cut revenues, and I'm going to get some of it back through economic growth. Can't argue that happened. That doesn't happen because it does. I'm going to get some of it back through economic growth, and then and I'll get to cutting spending. Don't worry, I'll get there. And they just don't. They just don't. I mean, Don Young used to, you know, and 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 Ted Stevens both used to, you know, praise themselves for how much spending they got brought home to Alaska. Dan Dan Sullivan does it as well. Lisa does it as well. Mary does it as well. Look how much spending we got brought home to Alaska. Well, you get to bring that spending home to Alaska unless you vote for everybody else's spending that they get to take home to their state. And by the time that's done, spending grows. And when spending grows, the deficit increases and, and we get nearer and nearer the crash and burn. So I, I, again, I'm not against tax cuts, but I am a pay as you go guy. And, and, to, and to get the dessert of, of, of tax cuts, we need to eat our peas and carrots. We need to finish the peas and carrots of getting, of getting spending under control. If we can't do that, we don't deserve the, the, the dessert. Okay. Will you stick on with me for five minutes just to finish this thought? Because I'm because uh, we're we're right at the top of the hour. We're going to jump back into it, and I want to finish up, and I want to apologize to the listeners for losing my sure. mind at the end there. But I, I want to know 
how do we fix that then? If that's the case, I want to okay. know how do we force that kind of change? If you were listening to us in hour one, I have to apologize. I was so wrapped up in what Brad was saying, and I'm so agitated about everything today that I let the show run over the end of the hour, and I apologize. Brad was probably in the middle of a very poignant thought when the uh, when the show ended, and so I apologize. I've asked Brad to stick with us here because we continued with a hot and heaviness throughout the top of the hour, and we're coming up into... Uh, this first segment here. So Brad has continued on with us and I, I want to, let me set the stage, Brad, for this, for just a second. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets, ak 4 sbcom It was the weekly top three. The last one was talking about tax cuts and how tax cuts don't end up paying for themselves uh, in the long run. They do spur economic growth. They do some other things, but overall the lock, the lack of revenue you're saying leads to more deficit spending. My comment was, that <clears throat> I don't care. I think that the money is better in the hands of the citizens who are using it because the politicians are never going to get their appetite for spend under control, which you agree, they're never going to get their appetite for spend under control, but we should pay as we go. Um, so if you want to recap that thought, and then I'm going to ask you the final question, uh, which we I said I told you before we came back from the break, but then how do we fix it if that's not the case? So if you want to tell me, you know, again, wh where I'm wrong, that we've got, you know, we can't just keep spending it because the deficits just continue. There is no political will. I'll let you I'll let you recap that thought before we come to the final question. Well, my 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 statement was I'm a pay as you go guy. I'm I'm one who says we shouldn't be running deficits. We should pay uh, uh, through taxes and through revenues as we go. If something's important to spend on fine then we need to pay for it. Both of us, both both me, a legislator, uh, or, or the legislators, as well as citizens, need to pay for it. If it's so important, so critical, so needed, then we ought to be willing to pay for it. If we're not willing to pay for it, it really isn't all that critical. Um, and and we, ought to, we ought to fess up to that and not do spending beyond, beyond what we're willing to pay for. And, and my point was, saying that we ought to do tax cuts uh, is sort of like dessert that we ought to that we ought to you know get the dessert of the tax cuts without going through the pain of the peas and carrots the the full meal that comes before it where we where we you know do the spending cuts necessary to get us down to pay as you go and then you get the dessert of tax cuts if you get to the point where you where you where you've gotten the de the deficit back in balance you've gotten you know the annual budget back in balance then you can have the dessert of some tax cuts to spur economic growth you have to do a little bit more spending cuts to do that but but you can get do that. You can do that. We're we're not anywhere near that right now. We're running twenty five percent of the federal budget is in deficit. We continue to grow that deficit, and we're not at the point where we get additional dessert. We haven't done the hard work that that deserves sure. additional dessert. Well, but the the thing is, Brad, with the with the people who are in charge, the politicians, Congress, the the the, the leaders, we're never going to get dessert. I mean, they're slurping it up. They're slurping the pie up uh, at the table all by themselves. And they're like, you're never going to get dessert because they can't control their spending. Right. So and, and again, you're not saying that you're against tax cuts. You're just saying in the long run, they don't pay for themselves because there's there's a lack of revenue that they want to spend on something else. So they go deficit spend it or do whatever else. So, again, Brian's right. Final Jeopardy question. Then, Brad, this is final Jeopardy. How do we fix it? I mean, I mean, if there, if we, if tax cuts won't work, if this won't work, if there's no fiscal will to do it, I mean, we're spending one point two trillion dollars on debt service this coming year, one point two trillion dollars. Then how do we fix it? Yeah, we came to we came we came to this come to Jesus moment in the early twenty teens uh, during the Obama administration when the Republicans put their foot down, Paul Ryan put their foot down and said, we're not going any further uh, uh, in terms of authorizing additional deficits, authorizing additional deficit spending, additional bond issuances until we get this result. And 2012, I think it was 2012, Donna can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 2012, there was an agreement reached between the Obama administration and, and the Congress that we were gonna do sequesters, that if we didn't, hit certain spending targets, spending reduction targets, we were gonna start sequestering. We were gonna start reducing spending on a pro rata basis 
across all categories and, and start bringing down, bringing down spending in that way. It was a default mechanism if Congress didn't do the hard work. Well, guess what? We got to the sequester, we got to the point when the sequesters were supposed to kick in, and then everybody said, oh no, we can't do that. The military people said, oh no, we can't cut military spending. In fact, we need to increase military spending. The 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 human needs people said, oh no, we can't cut human needs spending. We can't cut the rest of the, the budget. We need, in fact, we need to increase the rest of the budget. And so, sort of regardless about what was going on on the revenue side. Everybody, the, the, the Congress then came together saying, we need to set the, the, these restrictions of the, of, the, of, the, of the cuts aside, these forced cuts, the sequester cuts aside and can continue on spending. That was the moment. That was the come to Jesus moment where everything fell apart. So I would go back, my solution would be to go back to 2012, redo the sequester agreement between the administration and the Republicans, have the Republicans, you know, get on the brakes, at the next, at the next opportunity, the next time that you want to, we have to, we have to up the debt limit, put on the brakes. Say we're not going to do it. This is what we're going to have to do: get a sequester and then stick to it uh, uh, going forward. And yes, everybody's going to hurt. The military is going to say, "Oh my God, what have we done?" The 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 human needs part, the domestic part of the budget is going to say, "Oh my God, what have we done?" But everybody's going to hurt. And then, I think we will start getting this thing back in balance. We will start earning our right to desert. But still, but until we do that, until right. we live up to that agreement, we, 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 sh we don't deserve dessert. We didn't eat our peas and carrots. Well, let's go back to segment one. Donna makes the point. It's not Congress's money. It's our money. Is it really dessert if we're just asking for our money back instead of them doing it? I mean, I, look, I know you and I aren't going to agree on this, but I think it's the principle of saying, this is the problem. The problem is the politicians who basically are ignoring arithmetic. We elect the politicians, Michael. I mean, the politician will claim, and if we don't like them, throw them out. It, 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 the politicians will claim that, that they're just doing what their constituents want. Their constituents don't want cuts to the military. Their constituents don't want cuts in domestic, domestic spending. We're just doing what our, what our constituents want. And very few of those politicians got thrown out. I, you know, it, I, I guess I guess the logical consequence of what I'm saying is you don't does we don't deserve tax cuts. We don't deserve dessert until we until we do the hard work of throwing out the congressmen that keep you know that keep uh, avoiding the peas and carrots. That we've got to eat our peas and carrots by throwing out those congressmen that keep you know claiming that they're coming home and, and spending a bunch of money on us. Um, but that. I mean, that's we're not we're not going to solve this until we get to pay as you go. We're not going to get to pay as you go until we do the spending cuts first, because it's too easy to do the tax cuts first and then say, ah, uh, there's reasons not to do the spending cuts. And then we sort of slide until the next time people want to do tax cuts. Then we have this debate, then we, they don't do the spending cuts. And then it just just keeps on going until we crash and burn. And maybe that's where we're going to end up. But I don't think we. I don't think we should end up there. I don't think it's the right thing to end up there. And I think there are ways to avoid it by eating our peas and carrots now before we get dessert. I mean, I would agree that that would be the ideal. The ideal is that we pull ourselves back from the fiscal cliff. We become fiscally responsible. We make sense of it. The problem is, again, I don't think any of the politicians are feeling that. And I feel like we're fulfilling Ben Franklin's um where I feel like we're fulfilling Ben Franklin's prophecy when he said, when the people find that they can vote themselves money, it will herald the end of the Republic. Because that's, I think that's right where we're at. They've discovered they can buy votes. They can buy constituencies. Nobody wants to get hurt. You mentioned, you know, health, <clears throat> health and social services. You mentioned military. You mentioned it's the same thing going on in Anchorage, right? We lost 5,000 students, but we don't want anybody to get hurt. We don't want anybody to lose their job. And so when they figured out that they can vote themselves money, it's going to herald the end of what we're doing. And my, my comment and my position on that is right back to what Brian said. The philosophical underpinnings of this show says, shouldn't we focus on putting our own house in order first? And that's kind of where I was at. I agree with you, Brad. I, I want them to find fiscal discipline. Do I think if I was a betting man, would I put money on it? 
Not a single dollar would I put on of, of them finding fiscal discipline because history has shown they don't have to. And if the wheels do come off the bus, they won't feel the pain anyway. So what's their incentive to do so? That's my final well, question. And then we'll wrap it up for you. Well, to respond to Brian, I think that I think that putting our own house in order Ought to, ought to relate to the government. We ought to put our own house in order first. We ought to put our government in order first. And I and I guess that, as I said, I guess the logical consequence of what I'm arguing is that voters need to eat their peas and carrots by throwing out legislators, either at the state level or at the federal level, who aren't putting their house in order, who aren't who aren't doing the peas and carrots before they before they uh, uh, dish out dish out dessert. And 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 voters aren't doing that. Legislators aren't doing that. We're going we're going down this hole. But that doesn't mean that there aren't ways to stop going down the hole. And we should not talk about those ways to stop going down the hole. I think going back to 2012 and the and the sequester right. notion would be a way to do that. No, you and I are in agreement on that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't try. I'm just saying I'm also a realist that the likelihood of that happening um, and and had these guys voting themselves less power would be very small the likelihood is is very small doesn't mean that we shouldn't try doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it most people are not engaged enough to understand the stuff that we're talking about this morning they're like la 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 i can't hear you i vote once a year that's all i needed to do right that was my job and unfortunately they're just not paying attention and that's the unfortunate part um and if the super voters don't come together and figure this out then we're we're in big trouble um, all right, Brad. Well, that, that was fun. Thank you for sticking late. I know that you got other things you'd like to do uh, while you're on vacation. I appreciate you coming on board and uh, and joining us. What are you doing? Where, where, what are you, you listening to music again? You're still, you're still traveling, right? What are you doing? Uh, this is the week of the Celtic Colors Festival, and I'm uh, spending a lot of time uh, going to concerts. I'm going to one tonight. I went to one. I went to four over the weekend. I did two a days uh, over the weekend. Um, and and Cal and Cape Breton also is a great foodie location, great restaurant. So the inn I'm staying, the inn I'm staying at has a great restaurant. So I'm doing that as well. So eating and listening your way through Cape Breton uh, out there uh, in eastern Canada. So uh, I appreciate you coming on board. Thank you for sticking with us a little bit longer. Uh, and I uh, uh, again, thank you for all you do. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> My pleasure, yeah, Michael. We, we can't stop talking about it, Brad. We've got to. You're right. We've got to have conversations about it. It doesn't mean that I'm I'm happy about it, and it doesn't mean that I think that we can solve it, but we at least have to have the conversation to say we tried, right? I mean, that's what we could do anyway. So anyway, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and joining us. As always, it's good to talk with you. Thanks for having me, Michael. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.